All right, good morning. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Anybody slip on the way in? Everybody good? Not going to get an email later? No lawsuits? Yeah, all right. Solid. Um, glad y'all were able to make it this morning. Man, I, uh, I was glad we were able to meet last week and I'd missed meeting the week before. Uh, just excited to be back in the house of the Lord with you guys. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. Verses 14 through 21, if you want to go ahead and open your Bible. If you're new, I would love to meet you or somebody here. We would love to connect with you. So there's a couple ways to get involved. Number one, if you fill out a connect card on your way out, we'll follow up with you. Or you could come pray down front with me or talk or whatever. We'd love just to connect with you, help you on your journey wherever you are in life, uh, and to move your next step in your relationship with God. And so please connect with us. Uh, We'd love to help you. Also, before we jump in, a quick announcement is that next week we are at least temporarily starting a 5 p.m. service. Uh, The Lord has been uh, very gracious, obviously, and these these rooms have been full uh, pretty much this whole year. And so we've been trying to figure out what what do we do. Uh, They're full in regards to COVID restrictions. And so we want to be able to open the door for as many people to come and meet and to do so as safely and wisely as possible. And so praise God that people are coming to hear the word of God and to experience his presence. Uh, So we need more room. And so we're starting a 5 p.m. service. This is not indefinite. This is a temporary uh, way for us to open the the doors to provide more room to continue to reach more people. And so if that works well for you, if you know somebody who maybe works in the morning could come at night, we would love for you guys to be here if that works well for you. So next week, 5 p.m., indefinite. One thing for you parents, there's no childcare at the 5 p.m. service, just as an FYI on that, but everything else will be normal. It will also be indoors, so it's not the 5 p.m. we ran outside, because uh, it's like four degrees outside, okay? So we're not doing that. Maybe when the weather gets nicer again, uh, but because we simply don't have enough space, uh, we're going to start that for now. So just an FYI on that, and we'll just keep moving forward as the Lord leads and directs, trying to reach as many people for Jesus as possible. Amen. Amen, all right, I hope, that's good news. This is what we came here to do is to reach people for Jesus, all right? So this is a good thing, Uh, we're excited. Next week we start a new series uh, talking about, a little bit about the future of our church and a few things we're gonna be focused on together. That's gonna be a five week thing, so please make sure to join us online or here in person for the next five weeks. It's gonna be really important and I'm excited about that. Today we finish our preparation of consecration double over. Uh, We did 21 days of prayer and fasting. We felt like the Lord wanted us to continue to go into more. Uh, And so we've done 21 more. And today we kind of finish that with a final word from God. As we've been talking about the last several weeks, a few things to remind you of. Remember, uh, in the presence of God, the victory is won before the battle has begun. Come first, change second. Everything's about order, not balance. We must get our life in order. Stop trying to get it in balance. I want us to be a people of God who prioritize his presence and love to him the rest of the year. So the question for me as one of your pastors was how can we make this not just a series, not just a thought, not just a time together we say, oh, that was good, I learned a lot, but as a lifestyle, what does it look like for us to do that? How do we make this a lifestyle and pursue God's presence all year? What does that look like for us to do? And I was, I was praying and asking the Lord, what's the final word for this? Like, what's the last thing to say in light of this? Obviously, we'll continue to talk about things like this. This is gospel. Uh, but what does it look like for us to prioritize this one more time with a sermon? And the Lord just kept bringing to mind Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, and this phrase, being rooted in the love of God. Rooted in the love of God. Rooted in the love of God. My prayer this morning is that you and I even this very moment would experience the love of God in a deeper way. That we would hear about the love of God in a fresh way and that no matter where you are in life, wherever you're coming from, whatever your past is, whatever moment you're sitting in that chair in, whatever you think about yourself, whatever things you bring to the table, that you would know without a doubt to the depths of your heart that God really does love you. And that that would root your life. This is my prayer. And that as we leave from this place, it wouldn't just be a series or just a thought for one period of time, but it would be a lifestyle because we have roots in God's love. Also, knowing today is Valentine's Day, I just thought it was more than appropriate to talk about love, to talk about the best kind of love. 
Some of y'all, Valentine's Day is fun. Some of y'all, it brings bad memories. Some of y'all feel lonely. You feel like you lack love. Some of y'all feel like you're in the relationship and there is no love. Some of y'all love someone too much, more than God, and you're dependent on them more than Jesus. There's all sorts of ways we miss out on love or do love the wrong way. And what I wanna do today is bring us all back to this central place that you were made to be loved by God. That you were made to experience the fullness of love. And you've been trying to find that in other places. And I'm here to take your, on on behalf of King Jesus, to bring your dry, weary, burdened, empty soul into this place and let God's love fill it up today. This is what I want. And I want you to learn to practice this habit so that your lifestyle is one rooted in the love of God, rooted in God's love every day. That's what I hope that we accomplish this morning, to be filled up by the love of God. So many of you uh, know, how many of you are gardeners, okay? Green thumbs, people who like to plant flowers, Nobody, okay? Or maybe I just can't see, there's like three of y'all. All right, that's cool. We're, we do live in D.C., all right? Everybody's city people, and nobody knows how to do anything. Okay, that's great, that's great, that's great. Nobody works for their hands around here? All right, no. Okay, well, from where I'm from, everybody does stuff like that, all right? So, uh, hey, you grow up gardening. Oh, my fellow Alabamian has laughed in the middle. Yeah, she understands. Okay, uh, I'm from Alabama, by the way. So anyways, that was total tangent. All you people know, right, the green thumbs, especially in the room, that if you want it, the quality of your plant will be determined by the quality of your soil. Thank you, soil. The quality of your plant, y'all learned something today. I'm here to teach you the way of Jesus and to also give you some gardening skills, all right? You can do it yourself. You don't have to pay someone to do that, all right? Just put it in the ground. That's great. Okay, so this is what we're, this is what we're talking about this morning. To have a good plant requires good soil, And so it is with our life, to flourish well in life requires that we plant our roots in the right place, the right soil. So the question for you and me as we begin is where are your roots planted? You guys all know if you want good coffee, you gotta grow it in Ethiopia, not Antarctica. Can't build good coffee farms in Antarctica, why? Because the soil's not ready, it's not right, it doesn't work like that. But so many of us are trying to build good lives or experience full love, planting our life in the soil of the world as opposed to the soil of Christ. And then we wonder why it's not flourishing. And that's what I'm here to do this morning is to help you and me plant our lives and our roots in the soil of Jesus' love so that we can flourish on a day-to-day basis and live a lifestyle of enjoying the love of God and living from the love of God the rest of the year. Everybody good for that? We ready? All right, let's read the Bible, the most important thing this morning, and let's talk about it. Ephesians 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Isn't that interesting? God the Father, he's made you, named you. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. It's quite a passage, it's quite a passage. You should spend a lot more time reading and thinking about this after today to really dive into what does it mean to be loved by God. So two words that stand out a lot of think here that we're gonna talk about and focus on are rooted and grounded, rooted and grounded. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're grounded, all right? Kids, this is the one chance you can do this with your parents, all right? Teenagers, be like, mom, you're grounded. It feels so good, okay? You won't get in trouble, but you can never say that again, all right? Never again, just right now. This is your only time. You're grounded, you're grounded. This is what I want for us this morning, to be grounded, rooted, stable, firm, secure, deep in the soil of God's love. 
This is what God wants for you and for me, to be rooted in the love of God. So once again, where are your roots? When we prioritize the presence of God, as we've talked about all year, our roots will grow strong in his love, and then we will flourish. This is the rhythm of the Bible. Psalm 1, 2, and 3 says, His delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. That's how he's rooting himself in the love of God, to meditate on the word of God day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. It's an amazing picture of what does it mean to, to flourish in God's word, God's world. What does it look like to flourish and be strong? And as we read this, everybody in the room would love this reality to be fruitful, to be strong, to make a difference, to feel vibrant, you know, like a tree planted by water, to feel secure, to feel like I'm, I'm doing something, I'm doing well, that's what we all want, and that's what we're all after, no matter you call yourself a Christian or not, we all want to have this sense of fullness, and this sense of purpose, and this sense of rootedness, so the question for us is not whether we want it or not, the question is how does it happen? How does it happen? What does it look like? How do I become like a tree planted by streams of water? Because I feel like a piece of trash just blowing through the wind. I feel like a plant that's been unrooted. I feel shaky, unstable, empty, unsure. And God wants to root you in something so much stronger than what you can do for yourself so here's something you must notice. His prayer, this is where we're gonna spend a lot of time on, verse 16, is that you would be strengthened where? In your inner being. On the inside. This is what God came here this morning to do, is to do ministry and to your heart in a place no one else can touch. God wants to do work on the inside. And God wants to work and to strengthen your inner man. And this is the first part of living a fruitful life. I want you to see the connection between 14 through 19 and then 20 through 21 as we spend the rest of our time talking about this inner being type of idea. You should write this down for your life. There is an internal experience of God's presence that precedes the external experience of God's power. God works in you before he works through you. There is an internal experience of God's presence that the Spirit of God would work in your inner being, in your soul, in the depths of your life and your heart that precedes the external work of God's power that God would do more than you could ever ask or imagine. But we get those things flipped and we would love for God to do a lot through us or for our life to count for something without the first part of God doing the work inside of us. This is why the counseling profession exists, because we don't know how and cannot deal with what's inside. We can't, we can't confront it, we can't deal with it. This is why so many of you would much rather be active, serving and doing things so everything looks good, but on the inside you're dying, you're dying on the inside. And this is what God wants to do, is to get to that place on the inside. And this is why we've been talking about all year, order is so important. Come first, change second. In the presence of God, the victory is won before the battle has begun. That it starts with God, and your life goes from that point over for him to use you. But if you don't let him work in you, then he will not work through you. And he wants to do that in your life. And so now we have to say, I'm gonna pursue this inward work of God and I'm gonna trust him for this. So inner being leads to outward living, okay? This is how the scriptures play it out, is that your inner being, what's on the inside, is gonna lead to how you live on the outside. Even if you can fake it for a little while, what's on the inside is gonna lead towards how you live on the outside. It's the same principle of gardening, the same principle of trees. The roots will determine what kind of tree it is. So what's on the inside? What's on the inside? As you walked into this building and you're sitting in that chair right now, what's, what's your inner man, inner woman like? What's on the inside? How's your soul? How's your inner being? Are you flourishing, strong, secure, hopeful, trusting, full? Or is it empty, confused, struggling, dry, weak? That's where God wants to work this morning. It may make you a little uncomfortable, but that's what he came to do, to work with you on the inside. Now here's something we learn now. If God's primary goal 
is to work in you before he works through you and then to live that kind of lifestyle in and through, in and through. That means oftentimes when things are difficult on the outside, it's because God is doing work on the inside. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. So we don't lose heart. He's saying, hey, don't give up. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So therefore, biblically speaking, often what hurts the outer man strengthens the inner man. Now, if this is true, imagine you come to God and you pray. And you say, God, I want to be strong in my soul and my spirit. So what if the answer to the prayer for strength on the inside is for God to allow trouble on the outside? What if that's the answer to your prayer? Or this one, what if you say, I want more of Jesus? What if the answer to the prayer of more of Jesus is taking away some of the world? You have to think about this because now we say, I want to be close to God. I want spiritual strength and power. And then God does it through suffering and then we're mad at him for letting that happen. When it's what you prayed for. You, this is why theology is so important. You have to know how God works. Sometimes the very way the inner man gets renewed day by day is by the outer man wasting away. And sometimes when God wants to do work on the inside, he allows trouble on the outside to strengthen you, to help you, to work in and through your life. So this is what Paul's after. Paul says in verse 16, he prays that they will be strengthened with power. Why? So that they can basically, the rest of it is know the love of God. He's basically saying, y'all need to get stretched and strengthened so you can have more capacity to understand God's love. Because right now, you're limited in what you can understand. And though God's love never changes and is always perfectly full, your capacity for bringing it in, understanding it, receiving it, experiencing it is small. So God, when Paul says, God, I pray that you would go on the inside, that you would do some work on the inside, that you would expand their capacity to receive the love of God and to experience it on the inside. This is what Paul's praying. So I had this in mind, okay? This is, you know, I'm a parent. I brought this to church today, okay? Uh, this is called a jujitsu, all right? It's something my kids play with, all right? Any other parents have kids with jujitsu? Okay, no, all right. Well, that's strange. All right, so uh, these are jujitsus, and they're like these little stretchy guys, you know, whatever. It's like a, it's like a kid's stress ball, you know? Like parent and grown-ups have the things like this, and kids do this. Uh, and so it's a jujitsu. And now what the point of it is, is that you can just stretch it all sorts of ways, right? It just keeps stretching forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, and it keeps going. It's just really stretchy, all right? It's just amazing. They love to stretch, stretch, stretch. Really hard to break, but they do break them sometimes. Obviously, kids break everything. So uh, now you have this. And what I want you to have this picture to say, okay, what is, what is Paul praying for? Well, he's praying that they would be strengthened, and mainly the, probably the, another word to understand this is stretched, so that, that people would have more capacity to experience, to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. And so right now it's like you're like this, and while he's like this, he can only hold so much. He could probably hold a pencil, you know, not a coffee cup, that wouldn't be big enough. So, but if you want him to be able to hold a coffee cup, you know, to experience the joy of drinking coffee, you know, he's not alive, but if he were, and then you would have to do that. And then if you wanted him to hold something bigger, you'd have to do that, and you'd keep going. And if he was alive, eventually he'd say, ow, 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 you know, and he'd be frustrated and wondering what's happening. But this is what God's trying to do, is say, right now, your capacity to receive and understand the love of God is something like this, and this is how much love you can enjoy because this is how much you can understand and experience. And what God wants to do is expand your capacity to hold more of God's love, to be strengthened in God's love. I was waiting for you to laugh. I knew that would happen. To be strengthened in God's love. And this is what he's trying to do, to take you from here to here. Why? So that you can hold more. And so now for you and for me to say, whatever God is doing in my life as a follower of King Jesus, he's doing it and allowing it for the very reason of expanding my capacity for more of him. 
And if the goal of my life as a Christian is I want more of Jesus, I want more of God, I want a greater experience of his presence, I want a greater experience of his power, I want to know what it is to be loved by God deeper. I know there's more, I know there's more, I know there's more. So I want more, Lord, more of you. And then God says yes and amen, and then he begins to orchestrate things in your life, good and bad, to answer that prayer. And this is what God's doing, and this is what God wants to do in and through your life. So I want you to have that perspective. God is stretching you to expand your capacity so you can enjoy him more. So you can enjoy him more. This practice so that you can experience more of the power and the presence of God. This is what we're after. So what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna take a few minutes to reflect on and enjoy the love of God. That's it. I have a very simple sermon and a very simple message. There's four words in verse 18 that we're gonna look at. Breadth, length, height, and depth. Depth. Depth, not death. Depth. Breadth, length, height, and depth. Paul's prayer is that they would be able to understand how much God loves them to every possible degree, at every possible angle, that they would be stretched to be able to understand how great and big God's love really is so that they could experience more of it. So this is our prayer, and this is what we're gonna look at this morning. We're gonna use more uh, easier language, higher, wider, longer, and deeper. So God's love is deeper, higher, wider, longer. Deeper, higher, wider, longer. Somebody should remix this. Deeper, higher, wider, longer, okay? Deeper, higher, wider, longer. Deeper, higher, wider, longer. This is God's love. It goes deeper, it takes you higher, it lasts longer, and it's wider than any love you can experience. And my prayer is simply that you would receive and enjoy and grow in your understanding of how much God loves you this morning and that you would root yourself in that love so tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day you pursue his presence because you know that in his presence you will experience him. You will experience his love, his peace, his purpose. So that's what we're after this morning. So number one, the love of God is deeper. The love of God is deeper. The love of God is deeper than anything the world could potentially possibly ever give you. As we said, and as the text prays for, God can minister and touch your heart in the very depth of it, the depth of your inner being. God can get to those places. Listen to me, only God, only God, are you listening to me? Only God, only God can touch certain places of your heart. Only God, only God. Yet, we keep trying to ask people, objects, relationships, social positions, health. We keep asking all of these things around us to touch us on the inside, to provide help and support down in the very depth of our being. We keep going around us and asking our spouse to be what only God can be for us. Asking our friend to be what only God can be for us. Asking a job to give us what only God can give. Asking money to provide what only God can give. And God says, only God can go to the deepest places of your heart. Stop asking someone else. It's a challenge and an encouragement to say, yes, God can, God, only God can take you there. At the deepest places of your heart, at the deepest places of emptiness, at the deepest places of regret, at the deepest places of struggle, at the deepest places of insecurity, at the deepest places where you feel lack or confused or unsure, at the deepest places of your heart with who you really are, only God can get to that place. He's the only one. I hope you're listening to me. He's the only one. So stop asking someone else. Stop going to that thing. Stop buying that thing. Stop pursuing that lifestyle. It's not gonna do it for you. It's not gonna do it for you. Only the Lord, only the Lord, only the Lord can get to that place in your heart. And God wants to do that this morning, you know? God doesn't look at your, like, your life, your past, whatever might be disgusting on the inside, your insecurities, the things you're afraid of anybody knowing. You know, he doesn't look at that and say, oh, no, 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 no. God looks at that and says, let me in. Let me into that place. So I can bring healing and restoration and hope and love and power and peace and a future into that place. 
God wants to do that this morning for you. Maybe for some of you for the first time, you came in here and you don't know what it means to follow Jesus. You don't know what you're doing with your life. You're trying to figure everything out. And the simple message today is that God loves you, that God died on the cross for your sins to pay for everything you've ever done wrong, and that he rose again from the dead to prove he really is God. And now he says, if you would simply believe in me, I would give you eternal life. And I would come into the deepest places of your heart and start to do some work. God's offering you that this morning. It's a gift. To say, stop running. Stop trying so many other things. God can take you there. God can help you there. Nobody else can. So receive his love for you this morning. God loves you. No matter who you are, what you've done, what you think about yourself, God loves you deeply. And he wants to take you into those places and help you. And so let him, receive him, trust him this morning. You know, I was thinking about the love of God being deeper and how, and just to give you a picture of how foolish it is, when we try to ask the world to do something only God can do. And imagine like you have a garden spade. Okay, we're back to gardening. Imagine you have a garden spade. You would think with all my gardening talk, I would have a nice garden. I don't, okay? So just say no. I, I don't. I'm a big hypocrite, all right? I don't have a nice garden. It's just, uh, you know, whatever. So I just blame it on the kids. All they do is destroy the, everything. So uh, in the garden, you know, beautiful children, bad garden, okay? That's the way it works out. So uh, I, I had to, and imagine taking a garden spade, which I have right there, and trying to dig a, a hundred foot hole in the ground. I mean, you'd, after like five feet, I mean, five feet would be a lot. After like two feet, you'd be like, ah. Oh. You'd be so like, oh my gosh. Or imagine like, anybody snorkel? We got some water people out here. We don't have any gardeners. Got any snorkelers? Maybe one. What do you guys do all the time? Like, I don't understand. Okay. <laughs> anybody eat at Chipotle? Can we get something? Okay. Is there some place of agreement? <laughs> Great. All right. Fantastic. This is good. Um, uh, so anyways, imagine you have a snorkel. And you bought like some $10 one from the dollar store or something. And then you're like, I'm going to go to the bottom of the ocean. You'd be like, that's stupid. Like, what are you talking about? You have your little spade. You're like, I'm going to dig to the earth's core. You'd be like, what are you doing? You know? And then after you watch somebody do that, let's say they did it all day and they're really tired and they're like, I don't think I can keep doing this. They're like, this is hard. This is frustrating. You'd be like, yeah, you're doing, what are you doing? This is a bad idea. I want you to have those pictures of how ridiculous that looks and feels to you and say, when you're trying to let the world, you're trying to use the equipment of the world, money, success, other people, job positions, social status, you're trying to use the equipment of the world and you're trying to go to the deepest places of your heart. It's the same thing. It can't take you there. It cannot take you there. And that's why you're so frustrated. And that's why you're so burnt out. That's why you're so upset because you've been trying and it hasn't been working. And so the love of God will take you deeper. God can touch places of your heart no one else can. Number two, the love of God is higher. The love of God is higher. He wants you to know the height of God's love. God's love can take you to places the world cannot. It can reach places the world cannot. As a matter of fact, it can go all the way up to heaven. That's pretty high. And now, once again, let's say God's love can take you to new heights of purpose, of walking in the calling God has for you, of experiencing his love, even within your feelings and emotions. It can take you to new heights of confidence in him. It can, God's love can lift you up. It's what he, the Bible says he's the lifter of our head. God's love lifts us up. It can take us to new heights. And now, once again, we turn and we ask people, places, positions, objects, things to take us higher and give us new experiences of what it is to be human so that we can experience life life to the fullest, and we're asking people, places, objects, and things to take us higher, and then when we get to the top of the mountain, we climb with them, the view is very disappointing, and it's not what we thought it would be, right? If you've ever watched sports and you listen to people talk after they win championships, there's always a level of disappointment. Why? Because it wasn't what they thought it would be, because they woke up the next morning and had the same insecurities, same problems. They didn't change nothing. It wasn't what they thought it would be. You guys know this, maybe you succeeded in a job or you've had some sort of success in school and you did it and you worked and you worked hard and you got to the top of whatever it is you're doing. You got to the top or you succeeded in some way and you got there and you thought, man, I thought this would be different. I thought it would give me more. 
I thought it would take away my insecurities. I'm the boss now, but I'm still just as insecure as I was when I wasn't the boss. I make more money now, I don't feel any better about my life. And you're like, what? Why? That's because, that's because the world can't take you high enough. It can't. You were made to be with the Lord and to see the world in a totally different way and to say now God's love wants to take you higher and he wants to give you an experience of what it is to know him and to walk in love, peace, purpose, and fulfillment. All the things you thought success in the world would give you and it did not deliver, you have been made by God to find that in him. And so now God says, I will take you higher if you would come with me. I would give you revelation of who I am. I would show you what it is to be human. I would show you what it means to be successful. I would take you to the place that you think you're looking for. And you know the cool thing about this truth? Okay, you have to climb the world, right? So you're working so hard to climb the mountains of the world. And as a matter of fact, they're so small. You get to the top and you're like, this isn't what I thought it would be. The view is very disappointing. It's not what I thought. But I work so hard to get here and now that's frustrating and then you go to God and the mountain's much higher and the view is much better but the truth of the gospel is you don't have to climb it to get there this is the gospel to say man you're trying so hard to be a good person to be successful to be somebody to make something of your life you're working 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 you're climbing you're climbing you're climbing you get to the top of that mountain and it's not what you thought it was and so now you transition over to something spiritual you think okay I gotta go to church serve do all this stuff and maybe maybe that'll do it and the Bible says it the other way to say man you've been so hard trying to find something in your life and to get to new heights on your own you've been climbing 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 and then Jesus shows up and he says come to me all who labor and are heavy weary or heavy burdened and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. The story of the Bible is not that we have to get to God, it's that God has come to us. And he wants to take you up to that mountaintop of what it is to know him, of what it is to be human, of what you were made for and he's not asking you to take one step. You don't have to earn it, you don't have to work for it, you receive it. It's a gift from God to you. So the question for some of you is, have you received that gift this morning? Are you still trying to be somebody, do something, trust in yourself? Are you still hoping the world can maybe provide something for you that it hasn't yet? Are you still in that position? Or or have you received the love of God and let him do the work for you to climb the mountain and let him save you and let him deliver you, strengthen you, help you, and support you? Like we said earlier, have you been like a child to say, I am so dependent, I cannot do this, but I trust you? Are you there this morning? God's asking you to repent and believe in him, that he wants to give you a love that is deeper and higher. Receive it this morning by believing in him. For many of you, you need to walk in it. You have received this love that is so deeper and you're still asking other things and people and places to help you in the place that only God can help you. You've been up there with God. You've experienced what it is to know him and walk with him and still yet you will not commit to spending time with him on a regular basis and then you wonder why I'm so spiritually empty. The love of God is deeper and the love of God is higher and that's something available to you not once but every day of your life. This is what I wanna root you in. A series won't do it, a good sermon won't do it. That's why we say all the time, man should not live by sermons alone. This will not do it for you. You gotta go, you gotta open the book, the Bible, you gotta meet with Jesus. This is it. This is the only way to get maximum, maximum experience of his presence. And I hope Sundays are a taste of that and I certainly hope the sermons are helpful. But if you go from here and you walk with Jesus every day and you get around other people that wanna walk with Jesus and you encourage one another and you wake up early and you prioritize the presence of God and you discipline yourself because you love him, then you will experience the depth and the height and the length and the breadth of God's love. But so many of you, you want the experience without the practice. We said it two weeks ago, same thing. I'm just so burdened, and myself too. I'm an idiot, I do the same thing. Why I just know that God's so wonderful and I dismiss him so often and say, well, I got other things to do. And just for all of us to say, man, I just truly believe with all my heart, I'm so convicted that there's so much more to experience of God than I currently am experiencing. I'm just after it. I want you guys to be after it with me. There's more. There's more, there's more. 
there's more of his presence and his power, like not just in your head, but manifest. You feel it in your bones. You walk with it all day. There's more of his peace that passes all understanding. There's more of this childlike confidence and trust in him. He's more beautiful than you know quite yet. He's more merciful than you've yet experienced to the full. You know, his love is just better than you've even tapped into yet. And to say, man, let's get after it with me. Let's pursue this. This is available to us. So the love of God is deeper, higher. The love of God is wider. The love of God is wider. When I was thinking about what that means, the breadth of the love of God, I thought of a few things. The first thing is that it covers more ground. It's wider. So like it's a big net, meaning the love of God is available to you, no matter where you find yourself. It's wide enough to cover all of your sins, past, present, and future. It's wide enough to cover the sins of the whole world, one side of the globe to the other. It's wide enough to cover the sins of all of humanity from the beginning of time to the end. The love of God is that wide, wide. That's how you should see God, with open arms to you, wide. But here's the trick. So often we think if I choose God's way, I'm going to be restricted in my freedom because now I'm gonna have to do what he says instead of what I want and that's gonna limit my life. But I want you to know it's the opposite. When I attempt to live in my own freedom and choose my own way, my path narrows because of how insufficient I am to make the right decision for my best interest. But when I choose to follow God's way, even though I may feel restricted by not doing or doing certain things, my path widens because God knows what's best for me. And in your desire, some of you, to be free, you have limited yourself. You think you are free and you're fooling yourself. You're limited and the joy and everything that's available to you has been squished because you're trying to do it your way. But then God says, my path is wide. This is what I think about. Psalm 1611 says, you made known to me the path of life. And it's the path here is God saying, I'm open, I'm here, I'm open, I'm wide. And I was thinking about this. There, There was yesterday, the other day, I was driving And I was on like a main road, not a highway, but like a main, you know, main road, not a neighborhood road. And there was a sidewalk over here. And there was a girl running, like like she had her jogger stuff on. So this looked like a time of exercise. You know, she wasn't running from someone. But she was running, but she was running on the road against traffic. So there's a sidewalk right here. My car's right here. And she's running right by my window in the road. And I just looked back at her. I was like, what is she doing? There's a sidewalk right here. You know, I'm like, I just kept thinking, like, what is going through her mind? I understand when bikes are on the road, you know, it kind of annoys me. Sorry, bikers out there. I get it. I get it. You can't go on the sidewalk. I get it. But, you know, you're just like, let me go. Okay, so anyways, so you can't go on the sidewalk. But a runner, I'm like, that's what the sidewalk's pretty much for, for your feet. So you can walk, run, walk your dog, whatever you want to do. But she's running down the road. And I just had this picture of like, that's totally us. God's like, I have made known to you the path of life. Here is this sidewalk. If you would go down this sidewalk, you wouldn't hit oncoming traffic. And we look at that sidewalk and we're like, no, nah, no, thank you. I'm going to run right into all these cars. And I'm going to dodge and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my very best because I'm going to do it my way. My way or the highway. And the Lord's like, I've opened this path of you and I've made it plain. This is the way of life. Walk in it. His path is wide. He covers all your sins. Psalm 119.45 says, I shall walk in a wide place for I have sought your precepts. Look at that. Look at that. Obedience and obeying God's restrictions opens wide the path of your life. Come on now, you need to get your theology right. Obeying God and restricting myself based off God's commands is the very thing that opens wide my path. It's totally the other way around. And maybe some of you walked in here and thought, man, I could never follow God because the Bible's too restrictive and God's a big killjoy. And I just wanna say you got it all wrong. God knows exactly what you need, how you need it, and how he's designed you to live. And he said, I have made known to you the path of life. So take it and finally be free. Okay, finally, the love of God is longer. The love of God is longer. Deeper, higher, wider, longer. 
it never runs out. Just think about a freeway that never ends, you know? It's just like, just cruising. It just never runs out. It just goes on and 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 on. This is why you need to know the word steadfast in the Bible. This is what the Bible writers use all the time. Steadfast, steadfast, steadfast. This is how God reveals himself to Moses in Exodus 34. He describes his love as steadfast. Why? He could have picked a lot of words. He picked steadfast and he did it a lot. Why? Well, because steadfast means... It just goes on and on and on and on and on. It doesn't dip. It's not like God loves you and then you have a terrible week. Super selfish, rude, mean, all that. And he's like, you know. And then you're like, oh, you pick up your Bible and you you serve somebody. You say something nice to your wife. He's like, you know. No, 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 no. Your behavior doesn't change any of this. God's love is, isn't that amazing? There's nobody else like that. Straight. Forever. That line goes forever and it doesn't dip. This is what it means to know the love of God. And so many of you hear me, come on, it's like you're, you're driving a, a car that keeps running out of gas. Or you keep hitting a dead end. You just put in your love and your desire for love in things that run out. Even good things. Nobody can love you forever. Just so you know, people die. This happens. So even people who really love you can't love you forever. They can't do it. Nobody, literally, everything you love, or everything that loves you cannot supply a forever love. Only God. Only God. So take the path that leads towards forever love. So this is how he closes it. He says, verse 19, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the goodness of God. I love this part. He wants you to know something that surpasses your ability to know. This is what, okay, this is what we're after. Because so many of you walk in here and you're like, check In my brain, I know what it means to love God, and that's not what he's asking. That's not what he's praying for. There are two words for know in the New Testament. One is more informational driven, and one is more experience driven. And that's the one he picked here, is that you would know God's love, not just by information, but by experience. This is what I'm after for you this morning. This is what God wants, that you would know the love of God all the way to your core in your inner man, that you would experience it, right? I mean, it's the same thing. You guys know this. You can know something is sweet or you can eat it. And those two ways of knowing are both ways to know something, but which one's more powerful? Which one makes you want to do it again? It's the experience. And so many of us are settling for information. I got the facts right, Pastor. I know exactly what I'm supposed to say. And you haven't gotten to the level of experiencing God's love in the depth of your heart. This is what God wants for you. He's not not like mad at you, like, oh, you're not doing it right. He's just saying, hey, there's more. And you gotta get the information right, because it's a fact. You can't have your fact wrong. That's called heresy, okay? We're not after that. You need the right information, but you gotta take it further and say, Lord, I got the right information. Give me some form of transformation. Take it deep within my heart, in my inner being. Not just so I know it, but so I feel it, so I walk in it, so I experience it, because I know this is why Psalm 34, eight says, taste and see the Lord is good. Taste it, experience it. This is what he's after for you and for me, that we would know it, taste it, experience it, feel it. And to do that, you gotta root yourself in the love of God. You gotta root yourself in the love of God. Be rooted. He clarifies right here in verse 17, all this happens through faith. Through faith. Not by your own works, but by faith. So some of you this morning... God is calling you to put faith in Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection for your sins so that you could experience his love. And he wants to do that right now. And so many of you, God is asking you to exercise the same faith you placed in him the first time. To ask once again, Lord, I know you are able. I want more of you. I wanna walk with you. Lord, would you please help me? That's what he's asking. But through faith, not by works, does this happen. So let me pray for us and let's ask the Lord to do that for us. Heavenly Father, we love you. We come to you right now. We ask that you would show us yourself, Lord, that you would reveal your love to us, God, that we would know how deeper, wider, higher, longer it is, Lord, that we would experience it and taste it for ourselves, Lord. So please, please come. Please reveal that in the depths of our hearts. Work on the inner man right now. We open ourselves to you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand and respond to the Lord with us?